we start with the spot one a we have this logic program p where the input uh facts about predicate vertex and edge that represent a graph and basically these two rules allows us to select a set of vertexes and this rule checks that we do not select any two vertexes that are connected. And this is an encoding that solves the called independent set problem because we have to select a set of vertexes that are independent of each other. And then here we have this set of facts where all these define a graph. And just to make the exercise more interesting, we have also added one fact uh, that tells us that we have to select the vertex one. Now to do this, I have copied here the program and the facts. And just to make things simple, instead of vertex, I use the V instead of H, the E, instead of select the S and NS here. And similarly for this part. Okay, so let's start with this. So what I'm going to do just to make things easier is to call this rule R2, this rule R2, sorry, R1, R2, and this one R3. Then we can just first have a look at the dependencies between the rules. So we see that this rule defines predicate S that appears negatively in the body here and positively here. Then we can say that we have rule R1 that goes to R2 and we can write a minus there to signal that this appears here. The head of this rule appear negated there. And then from R1, we go to R3 and this is positive because it's not negated. The occurrence is not negated. Then if we look at the second, so its head does not appear in the third rule, but it appears negated here. Then we have here the arrow in the other direction, right? So then if we take away the signs, this is the positive dependent. This is, sorry, the dependency graph of the program. So then let's write here GP. And this is just R1 to R3. And then here R1 to R2 in both directions. And if we write it in mathematical notation, this is just the pair of the set of rules R and the set of edges R1 to R2, and then R2 to R1, and R1 to R3. Okay, so this is simply a way to writing mathematical notation, this graphical description of the, of the dependency graph. And now just uh, coming to here, where we had this uh, topological ordering of P, of GP, we can also write this here just for helping us. And then the, okay, for this, we have to say which are the, the strongly connected components. And here, this is one strongly connected component because each of these rules can reach the other. And R3 is the other strongly connected component. And then a topological order has to go first through this node and then to this other. Then we have this here, R1, R2, and R3. Good. So now let's do, this is the very first part of the exercise. Now let's do the positive dependency graph of the program, this GP plus positive. And for this, we just have to take the positive edges here. And then this is R1 to R3. And again, we can define it in mathematical notation like this, just saying that we have the edge from R1 to R3. Good, and now once we have this, we can just, uh, so given that there is, we can just expand this to LP. And if we go back to here, we see that basically what we were doing is for its CI, we were taking a topological ordering of the positive dependency graph of each component. Now, and then we were pasting them at its corresponding, its corresponding position. So here, given that 
awan and in the there's no there's no no positive edges that relate a one to a two. We can uh, a topological there are two topological orderings of this. Either we do a one and then a two. Sorry, this should be a comma. A one or a two or a two or a one, and this gives us the two option for LP. So one option would be to say we have first a one, then a two, and then a three. But we could also have uh, another option with a two, a one, and a three. But actually for the exercise, we just need one of them. So we will keep the first one. And then this finish, the, finishes the, okay, no, this almost finishes the second part of the exercise. We now have, we now have to specify what is the value of R of R1, R of R2, and R of R3. So, for this, we just have to look at the rules at R1 and see whether there is any uh, negative literal in the body whose atom occurs in a later rule. So here we have not of Ns and Ns occurs afterwards. Then this atom Ns of X belongs to this set R. But and now let's look at the second rule. We have the the negative literal not of Sx, but this Sx does not appear afterwards. Then, in this case, this is empty. And for R3, given that there are no negative literals, this set is going to be empty. So just let's write it here. Okay, and this is going to be important because now we are going to ground first R1, then R2, and afterwards R3. And when we ground R2 and R3, we can apply simplifications over the negative literals normally. But when we uh, ground R1, we cannot simplify the negative literals of the atom of the predicate Ns, right? Because given that, because what we are doing here is saying, look, when you ground this rule, be careful because you may get some ground instances of the of atoms of the form N S later. So don't do all simplifications with respect to this atom because you can get wrong results. So this is the way to protect this atom, this literal here from simplifications to say here that we have this. Okay, good. So then this finishes this part about these first two parts. We have all these sets and now we can move on to the next step where we have to find the ground instantiation of the program. Then to continue, I have just deleted all this part here on the dependency graphs. And I just put here our ordering, keeping in mind these sets are that tell us that we cannot simplify this atom here. Then let's start first with this R1. So we can write here that initially the set of true facts equals the set I, and also the set of possible atoms equals uh, the set I. And then we have to ground this rule. And then what we can do is first consider the ground instances of this rule such that the, the positive atoms in the body of those ground instances are possible. So in this case, they belong to, to the set I. And also that the, the negative literals of those ground instances are not facts, right? So then we don't have any fact about Ns, so we just can take care about the ground instances for which we have some for which we have some atom of predicate V. So we have V one, two, three. And I was saying just this very formally, but what we can see is that uh, is that if we have only the facts V one, two, three, we only have to consider the ground instances uh, of this rule where X is replaced by one, two, three. So then let's write them and we have S one 
if b1 and not an s of 1 and similarly for 2 and 3. Okay, now we can apply simplification. So let's go looking rule by rule. So in the first rule, we have V1, and this is a fact that we have. In We know it's a fact technically because it appears here in this F because we had it there before. So then we can delete this V1, and similarly, we will be able to delete V2 and V3 because we have them from there. Right? Now what we could say is, look, this atom is not possible then, um, sorry, this atom, um, yeah, it's not possible, so then we can also simplify, because this is going to be false for sure, because it's not in the set of possible atoms. But this is where this set R comes into play, where it tells us, look, you cannot simplify this NS, because even when grounding R1, these literals seem to be sure that they are going to be false, because here, we are saying they are not possible. There's a trick here that these atoms may become possible by another rule, in this case by R2, that is going to give us some instances, that may give us some instances of those atoms. Hence, we cannot simplify these rules by deleting them, because the ground, because this rule is going to give us some ground instances of them, and this rule comes afterwards in this order. Good, but then we can also do something here. If we look at the first rule, the head is already a fact, so then it doesn't make sense to have this rule, and then we can simply get rid of it. And because intuitively we are selecting one and we are saying this is a fact, so we don't care about it. And in the end, what this leaves us is with these two rules that are just uh this uh that adjust this okay good then uh, after this we can move on and now we have that the set of facts is the same as before but now the set of possible atoms is the initial facts plus now s2 and s3 are possible right because we have some rules that could generate could make those atoms true now, same story as before, but now with the second rule, we have to find some, the initial, before simplifying it, we have to find ground instances of this rule where the positive literals are possible and the negative literals are not facts because those do not interest us. So first, let's do it in, in two steps. We can do it just in a single step, but let's do it in two steps. So first we look for the ground instances uh, such that the the true the positive literals in the body are possible so that they belong to here and then the here we have uh, s1 from the set i and s2 and s3 No, sorry, wait a moment, I, I made this wrong. So what we have to care as about the instances of Vx that are possible, and we have V1, 2, 3. Sorry for that. So then we have Ns1 if B1, comma, not S1, Ns2 if B2, comma, not S2, and Ns3 if B3 and not S3. Right, but then look here. We also have this thing that we only care about about rules such that the negative literals, in this case, not as one, not as two, not as three, are not facts. Because if we have the fact, then we know that um, these literals are never going to to be satisfied. And in fact, here in these facts, I we have S one, so then we know that this body is never going to be satisfied. So we can already get rid of this one, right? So if we had done this initial part in a single step, we could have just written these two saying, look, this, we don't even write it because we know that S1 is true, right? But we can also do it just in these two steps. First, we write the rules such that the positive literals in the body are possible, and then we delete those that have some negative literal in the body that is a fact. 
Good, let's continue with these two. So as before, we can simplify with this part. And now look, S2 and S3 are possible. So we cannot uh, simplify it simply saying this is false. But you see here, we cannot simplify it because they belong to the set of possible atoms. While before, we still haven't gone to the, to this, uh, through this rule that would give us, will give us now that these two atoms are possible. So the way that the, this algorithm uh, allows us not to simplify this in a way is by saying that they belong to the set R and they are protected. But interestingly, for this S here, we do not have to protect them because the rules that define the atoms of predicate S came before, right? The rule S1, S1, sorry, R1 that defines S, we have grounded it before. Good, so then um, here we do not have any fact about NS2 or NS3, and then what we get is these two rules. And yet yeah, now if we look at them, we see that then here we have this typical cycle that allows us to generate either S2 or NS2, and here this that allows us to generate either S3 or NS3. Okay, and then let's move on to the to the third one. And here then we can update now the set. So the set of facts remains the same. And now these I together with S2 and S3, and now we also have NS2 and NS3. Okay, and now when we go uh, to ground this, we can, uh, what we have to consider are the ground instances where these all of these are possible. There are no negative literals here, so we can then consider uh, all, all those that are possible. So we could try, and now we have to be a bit clever here. How do we do it? And actually the grounder of Klingo, named Gringo, is clever doing this. Because here initially, if you started thinking, okay, first let's match the X and the Y, then we could, um, then we could here get like, uh, for the S we have the values possible values one, two, three. So we could get three values here, three values here that give us nine ground instantiations. But if we look at here before at the atom E, we see that there are th only three possible ground instantiations. So we could start first saying, okay, let's ground first this and let's see then what we do with the S. So let's do it like this. Then we have the ground instance with one, two, S1, S2, we have the other ways, 2, 3, S2 and S3, and we have the other with 3, 4, S3, S4. But now we have just checked whether all the ground distances of E are possible, right? That's why we only get these three, and it doesn't make sense to ground this, for example, where where the X and the Y have value both one, right? Because we do not have the H one, one. So it's not even possible, so it doesn't make sense to ground it. But now we can see that, for example, S4 is not possible. Then we can, we can simply get rid of this. So if I'm doing things correctly, these are the only two ground instances where all atoms are possible. We have E12, E23, that is possible, and then S12 and 3 are possible. Here we have S23, and in this set uh, one we have S1, right? Okay, good. And then what we know, now let's try to simplify this rule, these rules. So this is a fact, and this is also a fact. Hence, we can get rid of this. And, sim and here we have that these two are not facts. They are possible, but not facts. But this is indeed a fact. So then we can simplify it. And this is what we obtain finally, that we have these two integrity constraints that tells us it cannot be the case that we have S2, and it cannot be the case that we have S2 and S3. And to finish here, we can update the set of facts is the same, and the set of possible atoms is also the same because integrity constraints do not give us any new 
new possible possible atoms. And yeah, then we have this one, two, three, four, five, and six uh, ground rules that are generated, and the facts that we have are the ones that we had initially. And then this finishes the exercise. Now, for you, I think it's also interesting when you do this, also for checking that the result that you that you obtain is what you would expect, right? And then if you look here, you see that. Uh, atom one is selected, so it doesn't make any sense that we have these two rules to decide whether we add uh, S1 or not. Sorry, I said atom one is selected, I meant vertex one is selected. So these two, it doesn't make sense that we have it because we are always going to select one. And then what these rules are telling us is you can choose between vertex two and three, and this is done by these parts of the rules. And then um, given that this is telling us that we cannot have select two vertexes from the same edge. So with respect to this one, there's no problem because we cannot even select vertex four. That's why this doesn't appear here. And then with respect to these two edges, given that we are always going to select the vertex one, it makes sense that we have that we cannot select vertex two, right? And this is what this constraint is saying us. And additionally for this, we have that we cannot select both of them. Good. Nice. So I, this finishes this exercise and I hope you have enjoyed it. And now I move on to the next one. Ciao.